All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we can find a seat. Hello, fall is here, finally. Uh, a few quick things before we get started. Um, housekeeping, please check your phones, vibrate, silence, something. Um, while you have them out, if you want to open your calendar app, we do have a couple really cool things I want to get on it. Uh, one is that this Saturday is the last opportunity for Voices of the Past. We will be there regardless of weather. So if you're good with a hat and an umbrella, come on out. It's going to be great. Um, the participants, the guests who came last Saturday were so excited. The actors are doing a phenomenal job. I highly recommend the event. Um, if you are interested, Amanda will set you up with tickets. Uh, it is a fundraiser for us, so um, you can leave with tickets and show up for a really phenomenal professional performance on Saturday. Uh, next month, October 19th, our high noon panel is a little bit different for us and we're really excited about it. We're actually working with SCL Health St. Vincent's uh, for a panel discussion of St. Vincent Healthcare past, present, and future. I don't know if you are all aware, but uh, SCL Health has actually just recently gone through a huge merger and some of their administration components have changed, but they're really intentional about the future direction that they want to take and really base that in the history of St. Vincent Healthcare here in Billings since 1899. Um, and they have those records going all the, back, all the way back. It's really phenomenal. Today, uh, we are really excited to have uh, Carrie Clement with us. Um, it's going to be really fun. Uh, Carrie Keller Clement specializes in the history of the American West, in particular, animal, agricultural, and environmental history, indigenous studies, digital humanities, and national parks history. Thank you. Carrie earned degrees from Montana State University and a PhD from the University of Colorado. Dr. Clement is a postdoctoral researcher at the Montana State University where she works on a, on a just energy transition project on the Upsalaga, the Crow Reservation. Her current book, book project examines the long history of Brucellus, Brucellosis, thank you, Brucellosis, indigenous peoples and animals in the Montana and Yellowstone borderlands. So uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Clement. Um, thank you for that kind introduction and for coming to listen to me talk today about live stock disease in Montana history. Um, can everybody hear me quickly? Can everybody see me as a short person? I do have to ask that sometimes. Okay. Um, just as a quick note, uh, some of the material we are briefly going to be talking about today is not exactly appetizing. And some of the photographs may in fact be a little salacious at times. If it does, I will give you a heads up before that comes across the screen if you choose to look away or want to avert your eyes to some degree. Um, before we get started though, out of curiosity, how many of you have ever had to doctor a sick an animal without a veterinarian present? Okay, me too. How many with a vet present? Interesting. Anyone here ever had to produce papers or undergo testing to transport, sell, or buy an animal? Yeah. Uh, so um, for those of you who have been around or are involved in animal uh, health or human health themselves, vets and regulations related to animal diseases, like those that require tests or vaccinations, are an essential, if somewhat unwelcome, <laughs> part of our lives, especially for those of us who own or work with livestock. So essential are vet veterinarians in these regulations, in fact, that it is difficult to imagine life without them. They are, like everything else, however, or they have, like everything else, a history. And we can trace the start of Montana's livestock disease regulations to a letter in September of 1884. This letter came from Cattle Baron Granville Stewart, whom some of you may, in fact, recognize. In the 1884 letter, Stewart cautioned that stockmen in Montana needed, quote, some legislation to protect ourselves against disease, 
likely to be brought in by Seattle and Texas cattle, and I propose to have it at this winter session, end quote. Stewart penned this letter during a larger organizing effort in the Montana Territory by himself and other cattlemen for increased governmental oversight and regulations in response to wriggling parasites and pesky microbes that plagued Montana's livestock. In response to these cattlemen, the Territorial Legislature established the Office of Territorial Veterinarian in 1885. That title is then changed to state veterinarian when Montana became a state. And eventually, several decades later, the legislature established an entire regulatory board called the Montana Livestock Sanitary Board. Officials who worked for this board and later, officials who worked for this office and later board had broad power to quarantine herds, entire counties, condemn animals to death, and require extensive testing before issuing import or export permits. Although these officials sometimes faced opposition from Montana stockmen, by and large, they enjoyed broad support in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. What I'm going to be talking about today is the early history of these veterinarians and the livestock disease regulations in Montana, how they changed over time, and before I conclude with the story of one of the most serious animal disease outbreaks in Montana in the early 20th century. First, though, a quick bit of background about, Mon about Montana's cattle industry in the 1800s. By the, time of, by the time of Granville Stewart's 1884 letter, the cattle industry in Montana was booming, driven in part by hungry miners and settlers in the territory, and then later by the demand to fill empty bellies in, in outside markets, outside of the territory, and then later state. Uh, just to give you a quick sense, Cattle numbers between 1887 and 1880, so in, in simple 10 years, doubled. And, in, and cattle exports out of the territory increased sixfold. That trend would only continue in later decades, even when we account for the great die off um, during the winters of 1886 87. More and more cattle and horses and sheep flooded the range in the late 1800s. However, those animals also brought with them disease. And this, these diseases resulted in debilitating illness and death for the animals and sometimes even their human owners and or eaters. Documented, documented outbreaks in Montana territory before 1884 included bacterial diseases. Some of you may have heard these names before, some of you may not, like glanders or viruses like equine flu and hot or um, hog cholera, and then pests like mites that caused scab. I will, I will discuss some of these diseases in more, but not too much, detail later. <laughs> For livestock producers during the late 1800s, those illnesses were often costly due to loss in revenue when the animal's value decreased because of the symptoms or if the animal died. To say nothing of the fact that some of these diseases could in fact be um, communicated to humans. Producers would try a variety of remedies, many of which tended to be largely ineffective or even more harmful than the disease itself. Or if they were effective, were difficult to use to treat entire herds. Governmental regulations provided, therefore, often the best and only effective tools to control or eradicate animal illnesses. Beginning in the mid-19th century, local, state, and national governments implemented laws and quarantines designed to halt and stamp out zoonotic diseases. One disease in particular, some of you may have heard about or read about before, called Texas fever, is a notable example of these early regulations and quarantines from the mid-1800s. We now know that ticks carried the protozoa that caused Texas fever outside of the American South, where it was endemic, by hitchhiking on cattle driven north. Before the famous cattle drives of the 1800s, think Lonesome Dove and you'll have a decent idea of what I'm talking about, the ticks territory was limited to more southern areas in the United States because they were sensitive to colder climates, as well as cattle 
who had prolonged and repeated exposures to the tick and to the protozoa had built up some immunity. So those symptoms of Texas fever included, as described by famous scientist David Selman, quote, weakness of the limbs, constipation, bloody urine, drooping head, and lopped ears, end quote. For cattle without any immunity, like those living in more northern states, the infection was often fatal, with death rates approaching 90% in some cases. Outbreaks of Texas fever occurred across the United States following the Civil War as American settlers herded cattle out of the American South to feed a growing nation. These waves of disease occurred along cattle trails, at stockyards, at railroad stops, and stagecoach routes, and along stagecoach routes, excuse me. The disease became even more of a threat as railroads, which transported cattle and their ticks much, much faster than drives, overtook the cattle drives as the primary transportation method for beef cows during the latter part of the 19th century. The settler system of moving cattle from remote western plains or meadows to midwestern stockyards and cities enabled transmission of the protozoa and the resulting disease. In other words, the spread of Texas fever was quite literally a result of an expanding settler nation. But to protect their herds and associated profits, states and territories in the west and the midwest as well especially Wyoming, Kansas, Colorado, and others, implemented quarantines against cattle from Texas and other southern states. In Montana, Texas fever and Texas cattle worried powerful Montana cattle barons like Granville Stewart, and their trade organization, which some of you may know, called the Montana Stock Growers Association. Founded officially in 1884, the stock growers had a great deal of economic and political power in Montana territory. After the formation of the organization, the stock growers and leaders like Granville Stewart, Conrad Coors, and others became heavily involved in Montana territorial politics. This involvement, or their involvement in Montana politics, culminated in the proverbial cowboy legislature of 1885, where cattlemen dominated the session. In the cowboy legislature, the stock growers passed many bills favorable to themselves. These bills ranged from branding regulations to the creation of the powerful board of stock commissioners and also included the creation of the position of territorial veterinary surgeon. No, you're okay. Stockman wanted the person in the position of territorial veterinarian to implement quarantines, especially against Texas fever, investigate suspected diseased cattle and horses, and order the destruction of any infected animals. The regulations packed, passed by the cowboy legislature required that the person holding the job of territorial veterinarian be a competent veterinary surgeon. That language was very deliberate. And the requirement stems from the fact that in this period, in the late 1800s, the young, the young veterinary profession was growing, both in terms of demand for their services and practitioners. Veterinarians were quite defensive of their young profession against unlicensed, quote unquote, horse doctors, or those who did not possess diplomas from accredited universities yet still treated livestock disease. To separate themselves from unlicensed or uneducated folk doctors, veterinarians crafted a reputation as scientific authorities on par with medical doctors and academic scientists. So Montana's 1885 regulations requiring it to be officially a licensed and educated veterinary surgeon mirror the larger discourses around the veterinary profession in this period. The same bill that created the position of veterinary surgeon also outlined specific diseases stockmen were prohibited from knowingly spreading, including Texas fever. Following the cowboy legislature in May of 1885, Montana Governor John Tooker officially banned and then later governors renewed this order. Cattle from Texas and several other states, other southern states, excuse me, unless the animals were inspected by Montana's veterinary surgeon or other livestock inspectors, which included Brandon's inspectors. 
Inspection of animals trying to come into the state from the south usually occurred at rail yards or sale yards, although deputized veterinarians, if there were any, stock inspectors and sheriffs often made house calls if they suspected infected animals. Suspected or positive animals could be turned away at the Montana border or destroyed. Those duties were quite a lot to ask and much rested, therefore, on the shoulders of whoever held the job of territorial veterinary surgeon. Who would hold that job and how they would obtain it over the next several decades speaks, however, to the nepotism, cronyism, and patronage in early Montana politics, as well as to the difficulty of the work itself. The appointment of the first veterinary surgeon in Montana stands as a classic example of nepotism. In 1885, Granville Stewart was successful in maneuvering his brother, Thomas Stewart, into the position. Granville wanted someone to have the job because he was, he was worried it would remain vacant until the legislature met again in 1885. He quite literally wanted a seat filler. Thomas was not a credentialed veterinarian, however, in clear violation of the education and certification requirements passed by Granville Stewart's own cowboy legislature. The move backfired on Granville, however, in the next year, in 1886, when a credentialed veterinarian, a certain Dr. Kiefer, was willing to take the job, but Thomas refused to vacate the position. Imagine that Thanksgiving dinner. Granville was understandably annoyed with his brother and pressured him to resign, as did the territorial governor at the time, Sam Hauser. Thomas did eventually leave the job after several months of dragging his feet, and Dr. Kiefer took up the position in late summer of 1886. Kiefer did not stay long, however, before he left to work in 1887, before he left in 1887, excuse me, to work for the U.S. Cavalry Remount Service, and several other veterinarians struggled to hold the difficult position between 1887 and 1896. Long hours and tough conditions were the hallmarks of the position for decades. For various state veterinarians and their deputies, and their part-time deputies, excuse me, who were often brand inspectors, but also veterinarians as more moved to Montana, and some included actually unlicensed horse doctors, these deputies' work consisted of, as I said earlier, inspecting animals, including horses, cattle, hogs, and sheep at brandings, roundups, rail yards, and auctions all over the state. Um, Inspectors spent long hours looking for signs of disease like skin lesions, breathing issues, or listlessness to, say, to name only a few. If they suspected an animal had an illness, like I said earlier, depending on the disease, they could order the animal killed and the carcasses destroyed or require the owner to treat the infection. In later years, inspectors' work would also include taking skin, tissue, and blood samples as well as administering um, injections, medicines, and vaccines. During the late 19th century, for example, Texas fever remained Stockman's most feared disease, largely because of the specter of stock loss, like I mentioned earlier, but also because of the threat of quarantines from stockyards in Chicago and other states. Um, the state veterinarian addressed the threat of Texas from Texas fever by coordinating inspections with other states, chasing down stockmen suspected of violating quarantines and inspecting cattle trailed into the state or shipped in from the south. It appeared to limit, th these actions appeared to limit the spread of Texas fever in Montana as only a few cases were ever found in the state. In 1890, then state veterinarian Herbert Holloway attributed the absence of Texas fever to the quarantine regulations and inspections that his office and his de part-time deputies undertook. Holloway's declaration, however, is really difficult to say whether or not it was actually true, and likely the inspections and quarantines were less effective than Montana's cold latitude at limiting the, the ticks and thereby the disease spread. Either way, no cases of Texas fever were ever were reported in Montana at the close of the 19th century. In fact, state veterinarians reiterated year after year that Montana's cattle were overall in overall good health, even as Texas fever was not the only illness that Montana stock producers had to contend with. Other diseases that stockmen and state veterinarians were worried about included infections that may sound familiar to us today, like tuberculosis or anthrax. Other ailments that are likely less familiar may include scab, black, lean, black leg, doreen, or glanders. Scab, also known at that time period, 
with, uh, scabies mange and itch, and now we tend to sort of delineate those out, but in that time period they tended to collapse those, that together into one illness, was and is caused by mites and can infect many different livestock species. So you can see up here a photograph of a cow, of a, um, cow infected with uh, scab in the state of Montana. Symptoms start with extremely itchy skin, itchy skin before lesions form and the skin crusts over. Hair loss is primarily what stockmen were concerned about, specifically sheepmen. Um, but scab, especially in extreme cases, can also cause weight loss and negative health effects for cattle and horses. Um, so one of the ways that developed uh, it, to treat scab is, and some of you may be familiar with this, is literally running the animal through a concrete trough where they are submerged. And you can see here a photograph of a father and daughter at a um, cattle dip, likely in the early 1900s. Or Another disease that I just mentioned is, was called blackleg and was an extremely fatal bacterial disease that infected both cattle and sheep and produced lesions on skin and organs before death. Um, during the early 1900s, federal scientists finished a vaccine for the ailment and the federal government, in cooperation with state officials such as Montana State Veterinarian, distributed free doses of the vaccine to stockmen around the country and the state. Doreen and Glanders, meanwhile, were serious parasitic and bacterial diseases, re respectively that infected horses, mules, and donkeys. Equines with, with Doreen and Glanders were a danger to others both in terms of physical health and economic value to their human owners. And Montana's veterinary officials wanted those diseases gone from the herds. Other illnesses that Montana veterinarians had to deal with had vague names like contagious abortion. And during that time period could be any number of diseases. It sort of was a broad encompassing term. Like with Texas fever at this time, both home remedies and veterinary treatments were rarely effective. Quarantines and destruction of infected animals remained some of the most potent tools in, and only tools in controlling those infections. But the plethora of these illnesses meant that the state veterinarian and his deputies had a lot of work on their hands. The veterinarian in 1902, a Dr. Morton Knowles, as you can see a caricature of him here from 1911, complained that the work had more than doubled from previous years. Just as a quick note about Knowles, he was initially brought to Montana in 1894 by the copper baron Marcus Daly to treat Daly's racehorses in his famous Bitterroot Valley barn. If anyone knows Montana horse history or racehorse history, Daly is up there. During the 1890s, Daly enjoyed a winning streak with his racehorses, which included Tammany, which you can see a photograph of him here, who won Horse of the Year in 1892, and Daly's horse Scottish, Scottish Chieftain, excuse me, won the 1897 Belmont Stakes. Despite their fame and fortune, Daly's horses experienced disease outbreaks like many other herds in Montana, including an epi, including an quote, epizootic abortion outbreak in 1892. What, although it is almost impossible to say definitively what microbe was responsible for the 1892 outbreak, it did kill at least five-sixths of unborn foals that year and infected almost every single one of Daly's brood mares. Candidates for the disease um, include a variety of bacterial pathogens as well as several viruses. Because of this outbreak, Daly lost thousands of dollars in breeding and full revenue, as well as any potential racing champions. Driven by the outbreak, Daly hired Knowles as his own personal veterinarian. But like Granville Stewart in the previous decade, Daly also wanted someone he knew in the state veterinarian job. In 1896, Daly used his political power in Montana to move Knowles into the state veterinarian job. Knowles soon found, however, that the workload was massive and he lobbied his extensive connections made during his time as Daly's personal veterinarian for more funding, political support, and employees. With the backing from powerful stockmen like um, Conrad Coors and cattle barons like Marcus Daly, as well as TC Powers and the Stock Growers Association, Knowles got his wish 
for more support when in 1907 the state legislature created a separate board to oversee livestock diseases instead of just one person and his part-time deputies. The formation of the Livestock Sanitary Board meant that a small committee, which included the state veterinarian, oversaw the management of livestock disease in the state. Objectively, Knowles, as the state veterinarian, still handled most of the work, but now he had a committee of powerful men backing him up, as well as an expanded budget, which allowed him to hire more deputies, perform more tests, and issue indemnity payments to stockmen whose animals were destroyed to control disease. Knowles still had to contend with the same diseases as he did before the creation of the Livestock Sanitary Board, like bovine tuberculosis, scab, durine, glanders, and blackleg. But other diseases, like foot and mouth disease, would soon eclipse those infections in the new century. In the year following the creation of the Livestock Sanitary Board, in an almost prophetic manner, Knowles raised concerns about foot and mouth disease infecting Montana livestock. In that same year, so 1908, FMD had appeared in the eastern part of the United States, which triggered port closures and stoppage of interstate cattle shipments across the United States and Canada. In livestock, viral FMD causes blisters around the mouth and hooves of animals, as well as high temperatures, lameness, rapid weight loss, and reproductive issues. Although not as fatal as other infections, FMD can live on for several months on surfaces which then reinfects any stock brought in to replace infected animals as well as reinfect the same animal several times. FMD can easily be spread by a variety of routes between humans and animals including by clothing, meat, shoes, and hides as well, by, as, well as between contact between animals. And um, The disease was and remains a much feared one by the livestock industry and veterinarians. During the 1908 outbreak, the Federal Bureau of Animal Industry established practices of complete slaughter of any infected animals, detailed contact tracing, and quarantine of entire counties and states with FMD infections. The 1908 outbreak was contained to eastern states due to these methods and quickly stamped out. Knowles attributed that swift success to the cooperation between effect, affected states and the federal government, as well as adequate funding. In response to the 1908 outbreak, Knowles clamored for more money from the state legislature and in order to arm himself and his deputies against any potential FMD outbreak in Montana. He also sounded the warning bell about the challenges in addressing FMD if it did appear in Montana. Knowles cautioned that Montana's open range conditions, quote, increases greatly our danger, end quote, because the unfenced range made it easier for any infected cows, cattle's ability to roam and thus spread the disease, as well as make it harder for people to quite literally chase them down. The sheer size of Montana additionally would make it difficult for veterinarians and state officials to identify and control any outbreak. Knowles warned that Montana's only salvation, quote, would be in the quick detection of these diseases and the most active energetic methods of suppression employed against it, end quote. Little did Knowles know that six years later his warning would come true, albeit for a different state veterinarian. In 1913, William Butler, a deputy veterinarian from the Miles City area, was appointed to replace Knowles, who retired in March of that year. Unlike his predecessors, Butler had no clear ties to Marcus Daly or other Montana famous politicians or leaders, but he had worked as a deputy state veterinarian and federal official on and off since 1904, with a small stint to fail at mining in Mexico sometime around 1907. Butler kept the job as state veterinarian for 35 years, where he weathered momentous changes in the field of veterinary science, accusations of discrimination and misuse of power, and huge shifts in Montana's livestock industry. In 1913, however, Butler had less than 10 years of experience as a veterinarian and was about to face down one of the scariest outbreaks of livestock disease Montana would experience in the early 20th century. On a cold morning in early November 1914, Butler received a troubling telegram from federal inspectors in Chicago. They warned that a few weeks earlier, 
Several shipments of cattle to Montana from Chicago stockyards had likely come from pens that were infected with foot and mouth disease. In October, several outbreaks of the disease had popped up in the Midwest, but before federal or state officials could locate the exact source and quarantine the area, the viral disease invaded the teeming Chicago stockyards. And there were also several conferences um, and shows for uh, cattle and dairy cows and that then took the disease back home. From there, the disease hurried by rail throughout the Midwest and 20 other states. By early November, many federal and state inspectors and veterinarians were playing catch up in tracing and addressing the disease. The over a month delay in communication from federal officials angered Butler, who laid the blame for any infections at the feet of federal officials. Those officials in turn claimed that they did not have enough resources or employees to swiftly identify the outbreak. But after receiving the telegram, Butler quickly ordered an inspection of the rail cars transporting the suspected animals, which landed in Glendive and Terry, Montana. In Glendive, as Butler reported to one livestock broker in Denver, they discovered that 90% of the cattle in the shipments were badly infected. Butler and Montana had an outbreak of FMD on their hands, one that they now had to try and contain before it spread to um, anywhere else or any other Montana animals. Butter, Butler ordered that the infected cattle and any others that they had come in contact with killed, over 110 in total. The destruction of the animals, however, was not enough as the contagion could still be spread even after death. To account for that, Glendive locals dug a trench using a steam shovel in a gravel pit outside of town. Locals and inspectors then drove the cattle to the pit between high board fences. At the pit, inspectors then shot the animals and covered the bodies with lime before they filled the trench in with dirt. Inspectors also burned any exposed hay or manure along with the fences. The final step for the inspectors was cleaning their implements and, them cl and cleansing or their implements and clothing themselves. Other animals like dogs or cats who had come in contact with the infected cattle or the um, pens, any exposed cattle cars and pens, and they, to, and they would use a creosol solution to do that. The destruction was a grisly site reported by a Glendive News article as a 300-foot trench of death. But it was just the beginning of several months of horror. OK, just really quickly, I'm going to pause and show what I consider to be somewhat grisly photograph. I'll put it up, and then I'll take it down. So this is a photograph, actually, of the trench outside of Glendive, filled with the bodies of um, cattle. Um, during the late fall and early winter of 1914, controlling for FMD dominated Butler's and his deputies' time to the degree where they were unable to perform inspections for other diseases and slaughter. And following the initial killings of over 110, the remaining 875 some odd, head of a, some odd head of cattle from the Chicago shipments were quarantined in Glendive, where they posted armed sheriff deputies as guards. These guards were there to stop livestock producers from trying to leave with their animals, stray cats or dogs who came in to check out the cattle, and townsfolk who came in to just look at the spectacle. Only a few people were allowed near the stock to feed and inspect them. All humans approaching the pen had to wear rubber suits, gloves, and boots, and change their clothing in a designated shed near the pens, where they disinfected and fumigated their clothing before and after feeding and watering the cattle. So you can actually see here in the top photograph here, two livestock inspectors wearing some of those rubber suits. Even with those precautions, Butler reported that within a few days of the quarantine, cattle in the different pens showed symptoms of the disease. At, in response, stock inspectors and Butler in Glendive disposed of the over 800 cattle in the same manner as the ones in the few days previous. That gruesome scene was repeated in Terry, where a rancher had unloaded cattle from the Chicago shipments and taken them to his ranch. At his place, inspe inspectors found that many animals, including sheep, other cattle, and hogs, were exposed to the cattle from Chicago. <clears throat> 
After several days of quarantine, many of the animals began showing signs or showing symptoms of FMD, and Butler ordered that the animals be destroyed and the premises disinfected. Unfortunately, the rancher had moved the Chicago cattle through a couple of different stockyards on the way to his ranch, with the result that several milk cows and Terry contracted the viral infection and then spread it to other milk cows themselves. Like their bovine counterparts in Glendive, they too were shot and their bodies covered with lime in a trench. Meanwhile, Butler and the federal inspectors qu quarantined Glendive and Terry. Inspectors, uh, state and federal inspectors, but mostly state, had to destroy several more batches of animals in December in 1914 and January 1915. Um, the, a task that took longer than before because they were forced to use dynamite to dig trenches because the soil was frozen. In total for 1914 and January of 1915, Butler's year, yearly report stated that inspectors destroyed over 1,200 animals due to FMD infections and exposure, or exposures. In response to the FMD outbreak in, across the United States, Federal and state governments, including Montana, implemented strict quarantine and inspection regulations. In Montana, cattle shipped since late October of 1914 were required to quarantine for at least 21 days, and the governor placed a total moratorium on any animals entering Montana from any other state or Canada, which in turn severely restricted Montana's cattle trade. Butler defended these desperate measures as necessary because if the infection were to be introduced to range cattle in Montana, as Butler told one journalist, quote, it would take years to eradicate it and in the meantime, the cattle industry of the state would be badly crippled, end quote. Many stock producers, however, were angry about those measures and about the destruction, especially relative to being reimbursed for the destruction of their animals. Whereas other diseases had clear indemnity funds or reimbursements for condemned animals, the state legislature had not appropriated money for FMD payments. The federal government did, however, offer a limited like, reimbursement for slaughtered animals due to FMD, but it wasn't enough to cover what, the, what producers would have gotten if the animals were still alive. And the state did not initially offer reimbursement to stockmen. Butler and others, repeatedly raised the issue and in the late spring of 1915, the state legislature amended the regulations to allow for emergency reimbursements. In the meantime, Montana's livestock officials nervously watched national events during the winter and spring of 1915, all while still needing to address cases of other animal diseases like Doreen, scab, and bovine tuberculosis. Across the nation in 1915, FMD continued to rage and federal and state officials tried to stamp it out. At the height of the outbreak that year, 22 states in Washington, D.C. were under federal and state quarantines. In response to those actions across the nation, however, FMD began to uh, decline in 1915, and by, the end it was over, er, and by the end it was over in 1916. FMD did not appear in Montana after January 1915, and only 123 cattle were reported slaughtered for potential exposure and no cases or exposure were reported in 1916. In response to the falling numbers and with hesitant support from Stockman, Montana's governor modified the restrictive quarantine several times during 1915 and 1916 to allow some shipments from cleared states as long as animals were accompanied with clean bill of health. By 1916, the disease seemed largely gone from the United States, but the virus left lasting economic and political consequences. Over the course of two years, at the national scale, over 172,000 animals were killed. The financial cost was high across uh, the national level, and economic historians Alan Olmsted and Paul wrote, Paul wrote, excuse me. Um, cite that, quote, the federal government and the affected states spent roughly $9 million total to address the um, outbreak with about $6 million going to reimburse farmers, end quote. In today's dollars, that would be over $175 million spent across the nation to address the outbreak and over $186 million going to reimburse stock owners. These staggering numbers show how far federal and state agencies were willing to go to halt the outbreak. But that extreme cost of stopping the FMT outbreak also alerted government officials outside of 
livestock officials, to the seriousness of livestock disease outbreaks and also how funding prevention can sometimes be less expensive than funding treatments. Driven in part by the fact that the BAI or the Bureau of Animal Industry, the Federal Bureau of Anim Animal Industry, was slow in alerting the states, which again was because BAI said they didn't have enough inspectors and employees to swiftly respond, and in response to the severe economic costs from the outbreak, Congress and state legislatures dramatically increased funding available to disease agencies at the state and federal level. The national FMD outbreak also incentivized the federal government and states to greater coordination in planning responses to future outbreaks. These organization efforts led to a national plan that all states signed on to by 1917 that detailed investigations, communications, and control measures that emphasized federal oversight and management of nationwide outbreaks. This plan with the feds included Montana, despite Butler's anger and frustration with the federal uh, officials' delay in alerting him of the infected shipments in 1914. But these changes also occurred at the state level. Because of the outbreak and heightened awareness of FMD in Montana, Butler and the Livestock Sanitary Board enjoyed an increase in political support in the years following the 1914 outbreak. This meant that Butler's and, to some degree, Knowles' requests from previous years for more funding and employees now held greater weight. In the years in 1917 and 1918, the Montana legislature increased the size of the Livestock Sanitary Board, its budget, the number of deputies, and gave Butler and his employees office space in a new building, as well as a budget for a state laboratory and lab technicians, something they had to, did not have previously, and they had to send all of their samples out of state. Butler also gained a $25,000 emergency fund, indemnity fund and regulatory changes that would make it easier to conduct inspections. Like other states and the U.S. Congress, the Montana legislature learned that the FMD outbreak, learned from the FMD outbreak, excuse me, that increasing funding and resources available to livestock disease officials was hopefully in the state's best interest to mitigate economic harm from future outbreaks. Knowing how much a single outbreak could cost Stockman and the state economy, Butler used the new funding and resources available to him available to him to identify, treat, or destroy infected herds in Montana, or animals in Montana for the rest of his career. The lessons learned from the FMD outbreak and other disease outbreaks continued to impact animal disease management in Montana in the decades following 1918. Building on the relationships and plans created in the wake of the 1914 outbreak, Montana's Livestock Sanitary Board collaborate, collaborated with federal officials and other state agencies to address diseases like bovine tuberculosis, scab, brucellosis, and other diseases. Although it would be strained at times, the close relationship between Montana officials and the federal government continued and even expanded, as did regulations governing livestock diseases. Butler and his deputies' power to condemn and quarantine animals also grew in the coming decades, especially as Montana animals faced new and well-known diseases. The work and the reach of Montana State Veterinarian and the Livestock Sanitary Board had certainly changed from Granville's Stewart's 1884 wish for some simple protection against Texas fever. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Oh, that's a fantastic question. That could probably be its own talk in its own right. Um, <laughs> uh, it, uh, mm, yes, and. <laughs> um, it sort of depended on the time period, and it depended on the disease, and it depended on if it was cattle or horses. Um, in many ways, the, I'm trying to think about how to do this very quickly. Um, in many ways, the military were the first people, like the U.S. Cavalry, for example, were some of the first folks to, um, to implement disease regulation and quarantines. Um, they did have their own veterinarians, and um, actually, Knowles, um, after he retired um, from the head job in 1913, um, four, three years later would go and work as a veterinarian during World War I, um, and then he would die several years later. Uh, 
So there was actually quite a, it's, it's a really interesting question um, because there's really close ties between the military and veterinary services, although there's also some instances of tension there as well, particularly when, for example, um, state officials felt like the military or federal officials weren't doing their job. So it's a yes. <laughs> Good question, though. Um, I think there was one over here and then one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were, were there ever instances in the early days of this, this effort of, of violent resistance to the quarantines and destruction? <sighs> yes. Although not as much as one would think. Um, and, you know, there, there were instances, um, although they were kind of rare. There were a couple of instances where uh, Knowles, for example, would have to have his deputies take armed sheriffs with them in order to, you know, conspicate. The example I'm thinking of is conspicate some sheep that have, were infected with scab. Um, but it wasn't the level of violence that we think of, for example, in terms of like Granville Stewart's and the vigilante movement in the 1880s. Um, and I think for me, I see that because the lead stockmen and, and Montana power players in that area in that time wanted these regulations and they wanted them in order to protect their bottom line basically. Um, you do see and what's interesting is there was an example of in the 1910s where um, and this may, name may be familiar to some folks uh, Montana famous politician T.C. Powers had some sheep that were infected and, and were ordered destroyed and he got upset about it and so what he did was actually force his way onto the livestock sanitary board so that he could oversee what was happening because he felt like he wasn't being listened to. Um, yeah, good question. Good question. Um, so in terms of the research, there were some, you know, there was quite a close relationship between the research station and state officials. I find though, at least to the records indicate that there was a closer relationship between Montana State um, veterinary or, and, and animal research scientists, um, especially after about 1910 or so. Um, in terms of who supersedes what, it's a good and very sticky question that changes over time. Um, that is also a yes and question in that it sort of, it, it did change over time, although it wasn't uncommon for the federal threat of quarantines at the federal level to incentivize state quarantines. Um, there were, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for yeah, there there was one, for example, a, a quarantine in 1907 against sheep and cattle coming out of the Blackfoot reservation. Blackfeet reservation, and it was because the state uh, or the federal government or the Bureau of Animal Industry at the time, which then would become the USDA or become uh, part of the USDA in later periods, um, was threatening to quarantine the whole state. And basically say, well, if you don't quarantine the whole, if you don't quarantine the Blackfeet Reservation, then we'll quarantine the whole state. So, Knowles, understandably, immediately quarantined it. Um, so that's one example. Although there were times in which the feds would show up and say, well, this isn't our job. That's your job. So there's some interesting sort of complex layering there of jurisdiction and, and sovereignty. Yeah. Good question. Yes. Is there a veterinary uh -uh. No. Nope. There have been uh, there have been some attempts to do that at least in the past, um, and in fact, Butler was one of the folks who was trying to get it started at Montana State or at that time Montana State College, um, and it's just never, um, yeah. So, given your book about Bruce Ella, when does that enter this story? Ooh, <laughs> that's a fantastic question. So, 
Um, in thinking about Brucella, you know, obviously it's been around for longer than we know about it. Um, you, you see the identification of it as a disease that can be transmitted between humans and animals, or am, from animals to humans in um, the late 1910s. And when pasteurization becomes really uh, a lot more widely available is when you see, for exa example, like the city of Missoula implement pasteurization requirements. Um, there is an outbreak of brucell human brucellosis in 1934 that basically uh, incentivized all the major uh, towns in Montana to um, require pasteurization of any milk sold within city limits. Um, in terms of identification, for example, in wild animals like buffalo or elk, you don't see that really until the late 1910s is when the first cases are officially identified, but you don't see a lot of like scientific attention to it until like the 1930s, 1940s, and then it just sort of slowly picks up steam. Uh, you know, Brucella has been floated as a candidate for the epizootic abortion and dailies broodmares, although there's so many potential pathogens for horses to cause abortion outbreaks that it's sort of difficult to tell. High attack rate too for Brucella. Yeah, it is, and it, it spread really fast, which is, not, again, not in my mind is like, I don't think that was a Brucella outbreak, yeah. They, so they called it epizootic abortion. Mm -hmm.